In August 1931, a submarine cautiously approached the edge of the known world, where the frozen Arctic expanse stretched endlessly into the horizon. The vessel was not an ordinary one. It represented a bold new approach to exploration, a machine designed to traverse uncharted waters beneath the ice. The mission was ambitious, perilous, and groundbreaking, led by a team of daring explorers who sought to uncover the Arctic's greatest secrets. Their aim was not only to reach the elusive North Pole, but to probe the mysterious depths beneath the frozen crust, venturing into realms where no human had gone before. This endeavor was unlike any previous exploration. For centuries, humans had struggled to conquer the Arctic's harsh environment. Early expeditions relied on wooden ships that battled treacherous sea ice and frigid temperatures. Many of these vessels became trapped, leaving their crews stranded in a frozen wilderness with little hope of rescue. Later, explorers tried their luck with dog sleds or even on foot, only to face starvation, frostbite, and often death. Over the years, hundreds of explorers perished in their attempts to conquer the Arctic. So hostile was the environment that the first undisputed sighting of the North Pole wasn't until 1926, and even then, it was achieved using a modified airship that never touched the ground. But in 1931, accomplished explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins believed there was a better way. Unlike the South Pole, which lies on a continental landmass, the North Pole, situated in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, surrounded by ice that shifts and changes unpredictably, Wilkins was convinced that a submarine would be the ultimate vehicle for Arctic exploration. A submarine could navigate beneath the ice, avoiding the treacherous surface and offering a stable platform for scientific research. He envisioned a vessel outfitted with cutting-edge equipment to solve some of the Arctic's most enduring mysteries. The plan was audacious. Wilkins intended to launch his expedition in the summer, first crossing the Atlantic, then traveling north to the Arctic Circle. From there, the submarine would zigzag westward for over 3,000 kilometers, traversing beneath the ice for six weeks before finally emerging in Alaska. Along the way, the crew would collect invaluable scientific data, shedding light on a region that had remained enigmatic for centuries. However, such an ambitious mission required substantial funding. Wilkins poured his own savings into the project and tirelessly raised money through lectures and a book detailing his plans. But it wasn't enough. Realizing the need for serious financial backing, he turned to the media. The idea of a submarine voyage under the Arctic ice was captivating a story that could sell out newspapers and fascinate the public. Wilkins struck a deal with newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst, a man known for his flair for sensationalism. Hearst agreed to fund the expedition in exchange for exclusive publishing rights. To heighten public interest, Hearst devised a spectacular publicity stunt. Wilkins would meet another expedition at the North Pole. The massive airship Graf Zeppelin would fly overhead, just as Wilkins emerged from the ice, creating headlines about the pole being conquered from both above and below. Hearst even offered Wilkins a $150,000 prize if he succeeded. With the funding secured, Wilkins turned his attention to finding a suitable submarine. The vessel chosen for the expedition was the Nautilus a retired World War I-era submarine that had been heavily modified by renowned naval architect Simon Lake. Lake made dozens of alterations to prepare the Nautilus for its unprecedented mission. The bow was reinforced with heavy steel plates and concrete to withstand collisions with sea ice. Sledge runners were added to the topside, allowing the submarine to slide along the underside of the ice, much like a toboggan. A retractable hydraulic guide arm was installed to help navigate the hazards above. The Nautilus also needed to surface periodically to take on air and recharge its batteries. To solve this, Lake equipped the vessel with innovative drills capable of boring through up to 20 feet of ice. Additionally, the submarine's torpedo tubes were replaced with a pressurized diving chamber, enabling the crew to lower instruments to the ocean floor or conduct dives. Despite these modifications, Wilkins had misgivings. He feared that some of the new features, such as the sledge runners and ice drills, might be unnecessary or even dangerous. Nonetheless, 
Lake had the final say on the design, and Wilkins had no choice but to accept the submarine as it was. In March 1931, as preparations neared completion, Wilkins projected confidence for the media, but privately, he was worried. His concerns proved valid when repeated mechanical failures delayed the expedition. The ice drills malfunctioned during testing, forcing the team to bring in a separate engineering firm for repairs. As weeks turned into months, Wilkins grew increasingly anxious. If the Nautilus failed to meet the Graf Zeppelin at the North Pole, he would lose the prize money and face public humiliation. By June, Wilkins decided to press on despite the unresolved issues. The journey across the Atlantic was grueling. The tiny submarine was battered by fierce storms, and the crew struggled with the cramped and uncomfortable conditions. With 20 men aboard, there was only a single toilet, located between two roaring diesel engines. The living quarters were so tight that the crew had to stand most of the time, with only a few bunks shared among them. The situation worsened when the bilge pump failed, causing sewage, oil, and seawater to slosh around their feet. Mechanical problems plagued the Nautilus throughout the voyage. One of its two engines failed, forcing the submarine to limp forward at reduced speed. On June 15, after days without radio contact, the Nautilus was discovered adrift by the battleship Wyoming. Both engines were dead, and the submarine had to be towed the rest of the way across the Atlantic. For crew members quit, and the Nautilus required extensive repairs, delaying the expedition even further. By this point, it was impossible to meet the Graf Zeppelin, and her surprise money was forfeited. The media, once captivated by Wilkins' audacious plan, turned against him, publishing mocking headlines that questioned the mission's viability. Despite these setbacks, Wilkins refused to give up. On July 28, the Nautilus finally departed for the North Pole. The submarine remained riddled with problems, but the crew had become adept at making repairs on the go. By mid-August, they reached the edge of the Arctic ice. For the first time, the men stepped out of the cramped vessel to collect scientific data, including measurements of water temperature and salinity. One significant discovery was a warmer layer of water deep beneath the surface, which scientists believed could be vital for weather prediction. As the Nautilus ventured further north, the challenges intensified. The crew endured freezing temperatures and constant illness. The submarine had no heating or insulation, and the men were exposed to lead poisoning from the pipes. Despite their growing exhaustion, Wilkins pushed onward. On August 27, he gave the order to dive beneath the ice, but the Nautilus refused to submerge. The diving rudder, crucial for controlling vertical motion, had vanished possibly due to sabotage by the discontented crew. Facing mounting pressure from Hearst and the threat of financial ruin, Wilkins made a desperate decision. On August 31st, he ordered the Nautilus to ram itself beneath the ice. The sound of the submarine scraping against the frozen ceiling was deafening, and the crew feared the vessel would be torn apart. After several harrowing attempts, it became clear that the expedition could not continue. On September 6th, Wilkins announced the mission's end. Though the Nautilus had achieved significant milestones, including traveling further under the ice than any vessel before it, the expedition was deemed a failure. It would be another 27 years before a nuclear-powered submarine successfully crossed the Arctic beneath the ice. The original Nautilus, too damaged to be salvaged, was deliberately sunk off the coast of Norway. Wilkins, once celebrated as one of the greatest explorers of his time, spent the rest of his life in obscurity, financially ruined and largely forgotten by history. Yet his contributions to polar exploration remain undeniable. After his death at age 70, his ashes were scattered at the North Pole, fulfilling his final wish and cementing his legacy in the icy expanse he had dedicated his life to exploring.